Can you hear me? Yeah! Um, if you're following along in the book, this starts a little bit in, so don't start at the beginning. Shit. Mel wakes up. Melon has severe toothache. He spent the morning chewing on a wet towel. His mother grabs his head and tries to wrench over his jaw. Let me see, what's going on in there? Like a horse inspector, she pries his lips open. A muffled protest as he tries to keep his lips shut. There's little he can do. What, your own mother can't look in your mouth? My own son, I breastfed you for two years and this is the thanks I get? <laughs> and she looks. No one exactly blames Millen for the dentist who died 12 minutes after his appointment with an embolism in the office kitchen, or for the hygienist who went mad, shrieking, collapsing to the exam room floor, rolling into a ball and muttering to her knees. They were thought to be two unfortunate and wholly unrelated events. He was only a boy at the time, but Millen knew what he saw. He's seen it himself countless times, and has grown used to the sight of the universe and all its realms. Where most people have nothing but warm, fetid air and a distant cave, cave wall of a throat, Millen holds the cosmos, all time, all space. Above his tongue and around the dingle dangle of his uvula, he holds all that ever was and will be the planets and oceans and stars and black holes, the galaxies waking and dying. And with the galaxies and oceans and stars, he holds the past, present, and future the very elements of certainty and potential. It is a portrait of the universe so complete, so all at once, that most humans simply cannot digest it. But Amma is no better or madder than she was before she looked in his mouth. She is, after all, his mother, and there are no cosmic vistas between Mill's molders that she hasn't already seen. Since taking Mill in, she spent much of her internal energy convincing herself that he was just like any other boy his age, but his various phenomena were minor idiosyncrasies, just Millen, being Millen, being Millen. All morning you've been chewing that towel, Anna says. It's time to see the D-E-N-T-I-S-T. <laughs> Mill hasn't been to the dentist in years for fear of committing homicide or inside of hysteria. <laughs> he rarely risks opening his mouth, which has turned him into a quiet man. Some see him as taciturn, others as very intelligent. Either way, he's managed to build a life in which his condition poses few problems, except on days like today. As he reclines in the examination chair, the bib chained around his neck, he fingers the instruments on the metal tray, his nerves surging at the thought of someone catching him here, fingering these instruments. He hopes for a young dentist, someone robust and easily extracted, someone from the Wikipedia generation whose only interest in the cosmos is limited to alien autopsies. Such a dentist, he believes, might have a chance at surviving the view between his lips. She enters. He stands, rip, rips off the bit, and charges for the door. <laughs> Stop! She puts her hand up. He stops. She is one foot shorter than he is. Sit down, she orders. She's so very pretty. She's too pretty to die in this office. She wears her hair like a frown line, and two braids strapped to the top of her head. He fixes his gaze on the door. I feel fine now, he says. Sit down. The pain is gone. Have a seat. He looks down at her again and sits. Ada Weinstein, goddess, tyrant, DDS. <laughs> Mel knows Ada Weinstein. She comes into the market every Thursday at four, brings her own bags and buys soy milk, gallons of it at a time. With a flick of her wrist, she pushes him back into the chair. And in a single practiced sweep, she rams her knee into his ribs. Open up Milan, she pronounces his name like the Italian city, which is what most people do before they know him, before he musters the courage to tell him to tell them that actually the emphasis is on the first syllable. Now is not the time, he senses, to correct your emphasis. I should go. Open up now. She pushes her knee into his ribs. He squeezes his eyes shut, and silently, he prays, he pleads, he repents, he bargains, he begs, and finally, he parts his lips. She jabs the mirror in, clacks it between his teeth and forces him wider. With one arm, she reaches up and turns on the double lamp, heatless as it shines down. Right, is all she says. That's it, nice and wide. It's a 
just about here. She sinks the pig into his molar and he squeals with pain. There we go, she says. Let's get some anesthetic in there. And that's it. No hysterics. So far, no death. If she sees the universe and all its realms between its jaws, she says nothing. Perhaps she's seen it all before, being a dentist. Perhaps she's being blind, she's so incredibly focused that she's not, she sees nothing but one molar, one toothy wormhole. He laughs with relief, the mirror is still in his mouth. She looks up, everything all right? He makes a sound that means yes. And she gets to work, this woman of women. He leans into her gloved hand, silky and solid inside his jaw. If there is pain, he feels none of it. She works tightly, efficiently. And before he can, he can ask her what she is, who she is, how she came to be, she is pressing a filling into his molar and telling him to bite down. She picks up the long white tube and sucks the saliva from his mouth. When he tries to speak, to say something, anything, even a thank you would suffice. His lips flap lamely, numbed by the anesthetic and beyond his control. A trail of dribble courses past his lips, down his chin, and onto the slick blue plane of his bib. When he opens his eyes, she is done, gone, her voice trilling brilliantly in the room next door. Woo!